Hi everyone, welcome to our first fall webinar for CCC Maker. We are embarking on our journey towards sustainability and as such we have as our first guests today uh, Suzanne Valerie and Rob Maybury from Alan Hancock College and from the Central Coast Makerspace Collaborative. Uh, I just want to uh, take a moment before we um, formally introduce everyone to, to just let you know that the focus for this next six months is going to be on sustainability in a number of different ways. And obviously this webinar is our first step where we're taking people through a process of uh, planning and revising in order to develop a new proposal. Uh, we're also going to be doing a series of webinars on curriculum development, entrepreneurship and network development all of these webinars will be with the colleges in our network presenting their work. So we're shifting into a different uh, approach to webinars in this, our final year, where we will be showcasing the, the work coming from the colleges. So the great thing about this is you'll be learning from each other. Uh, this work that we're doing today is the first step that will culminate in our symposium uh, on the 30th of November at College of the Canyons down here in the Los Angeles area. So we're looking forward to seeing everyone. Um, we're looking forward to seeing everyone there on that day where we'll be continuing this work. And then this is a new announcement which we will be making formal uh, in the next week or two. Uh, given the success of the NACI Go West conference last week in San Francisco about making an entrepreneurship, we have decided to team up with NACI to hold a full open conference next April uh, where you, the colleges and the entrepreneurship community will be coming together to present the work of our uh, of our initiative over the last three years and we will be inviting a number of foundations and other representatives uh, from the larger educational community so this is going to be a, a big event and we're looking forward to everyone uh, participating in this so it's very exciting uh, so yeah. just uh, did you got to get on a call yeah uh, it's a, a video conference oh, I'm sorry oh. I'm, I'm just going to mute you Daniel oh, you like that I will. Thank you. And another sale day. Yeah. A few thousand. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. So our next, uh, uh, the, the, the event that we're talking about, um, is going to be the culmination of a planning process that you are all involved in right now within your own institutions. Uh, and one of the reasons we have Suzanne and Rob here today is because they've already started this work. And um, maybe uh, Rob, would you like to tell us a little bit about what we see in this image and what this event was? Yeah. Uh I'm sure most of you know that we have a uh, we have a network of makerspaces here in Santa Maria. Um, we're partnered. The Allen Hancock College is partnered with uh, the City Library and the uh, Children's Museum, uh, and and our makerspaces are kind of coordinated in 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 many ways. And um, and going forward, we as a as a as a network are trying to strategize about okay what's this going to look like what what kind of uh, form will it take uh how how are we going to sustain uh the work that we've done because um it's pretty it's a pretty it's a pretty good I initiative you know uh and uh, uh i'm kind of excited about today's uh webinar because sustainability it, it kind of can approach it really the way we did way back at the C grant in that, you know, we could sort of focus on the constraints and all the problems that we have and, oh my gosh, this is stands in the way and that stands in the way and that stands in the way. And we didn't really launch this initiative with the constraints guiding the process. We launched the initiative with the possibilities, okay, uh, and, and the opportunities and and the people that want to do that. and and. I think Suzanne's going to talk a lot about sustainability is not just certainly fundraising is part of it, but, but it's, it's, it's much more than that. We're going to explore that today. 
And the key, the key to going forward is going to be the people that we have, you know, in our, in our network and our ecosystem, however you want to describe it. And, uh, and that's really the key to, to unleashing this, this new round of maker spaces in our communities, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and, looking forward to it. and I, I'd just like to point out too, that's Suzanne in, in the back of the room hiding out there near the door. <laughs> But Suzanne, it's, it's wonderful because Suzanne has come in and is working with Rob on the overall project as an evaluator within their, within their um, project. And, and community colleges projects don't generally have evaluators working in this, in this way so closely. So this is a really interesting feature of your collaborative. And so... Uh, I just want everyone to to understand that Suzanne is deeply involved in the work of of this collaborative. Um, Suzanne and Bree Lindsay and Rob co-wrote a paper that was presented at ISAM over the summer. That's the International Symposium of Academic Academic Makerspaces in um, at Stanford University, and it was a uh, it, it's really terrific to see how this team has come together and how you're working together towards this common goal. There's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of moving parts in the work that they're doing. Um, and so I'm really, really glad that they've agreed to share the work today. So Suzanne, over to you. So I'll take it away. And I should preface a little bit of my background. I actually worked at Hancock College for 14 years as the director of the grants office and have spent uh, my entire professional career uh, in many aspects of, of grants and grants management, and grant writing, and um, evaluating grant projects and so on. Uh, and now I'm uh, pleased to be retired and um, equally pleased to be working as a consultant on this project and uh, working with the partnership. I really uh, am strongly committed to this initiative in, in Santa Maria, which is a, a, a geographic area where, you know, the, the children, the residents, the participants in the community there will really benefit from this resource. So what I do uh, want to talk about is the challenges of uh, sustaining grant funded programs. It's always the case when we write proposals, we have to talk about how we're going to sustain the project after the funding period. And we're now facing that. And um, Again, it's always the challenge. So, so I'm, I do a variety of trainings in the communities around here uh, with the nonprofit communities and so on. And this is something that I've been asked to write more about. So this is a good prelude for me. And I was pleased to find this definition of sustainability from the Department of Labor, who, as you probably know, they're they often fund very large projects, and that's a big issue on how it'll be sustained. But their definition includes just ensuring that the goals of the project continue to be met through activities that are consistent with the current conditions and resources that are available. In other words, it's not necessary uh, to consider your project going forward in exactly the same ways as you've been managing it so far because circumstances are going to change. And so a real assessment of things um, really needs to take place as you're going forward with a plan for sustainability. I would suggest these three R's um, to consider to get started, to review what uh, your early data already indicates, you're doing quarterly reports, and no doubt from that you can extrapolate some trend lines to indicate what's worked, what might need modification, what things could be changed or possibly even deleted from your activities. And then to refine your goals and objectives again, um, based on, you know, if you look at your original logic model that was sent uh, with your very uh, original proposal, you know, that I looked at some of those and I have to say they were quite aspirational. Um, people wanted to achieve great goals. And then, of course, you have the nuts and bolts of everyday activities. 
So perhaps reviewing that logic model again would be a good place to get started with this process to see if those outcomes that you envisioned at the time are still relevant and maybe even more relevant now that you've had a couple of years of experience and see what you can do going forward. And, um, you know, and a, a, I also want to suggest that it's important to look at potential obstacles to sustaining your programs, aside from funding. We know funding is the big thing, but there are other things that have to be considered in your sustainability plan as well. Where are the potential uh, bumps in the road and uh, what can you do now to start strategizing on how to address uh, those, what those potential issues might be uh, for, you know, put bringing a new program into a community college and it's becoming institutionalized is a major challenge and there will no doubt be bumps in the road beyond the ones you've already experienced. So moving to the next slide, um, I don't know how much you've been doing to evaluate the effectiveness of your program so far. I know you've been collecting and reporting data, but it's important to use feedback and evaluation uh, going forward. You know, we like to think in terms of continuous quality improvement. If you're always looking at your data, looking, getting feedback from your constituents, that can help guide what's been working, what might need modification. Uh, certainly you're documenting your accomplishments, but also do you know who all of your stakeholders are? You know, it's not just the students. There are a variety of stakeholders that to be considered in your project. And uh, it's also important to have a good understanding of the cost and benefit. You know, we could be achieving some great outcomes, but at what cost? And is that sustainable? And if you don't have answers to these questions to support your claims, now would be a good time to really start putting some processes in place to begin to collect that data. And then again, too, the, another important factor is to be communicating your program's values to all of those uh, who need to know about it because you need to be making sure that you're getting champions along the way. And um, um, those champions are the, as Rob was saying, it's the champions are the people you're going to have to rely on to help you make the case for sustaining your programs. So identifying them and then communicating with them on a regular basis is part of the challenge that you face. I would think that now people want to start planning for the next three to five years. You know, I think the first year was a lot about uh, just establishing your space and um, uh, purchasing equipment. The second year was a lot about developing programming and, and dealing with the challenge of staffing and so on. And now the factors that are coming into play um, are probably going to be more comprehensive than that. So the plan is important. Can, can I just make a, a quick comment in here, Suzanne? Sure, sure. You know, when you think about some of the uh, tools that we've been using already uh, as part of the reporting, as Suzanne mentioned, you're providing data through your quarterly reports. However, you're also creating uh, narrative reporting where you're telling us success stories, all that sort of stuff. This information is really important. One of the reasons we're asking you to report it is so that you're essentially building up your own database of stories and information um, that could be the starting point for, uh, I mean, it's very generic information across all the colleges, but it it's, could provide a foundation for the, the data that you can then build on. And remember, you've got your ecosystem mapping with Kumu. Um, so when you're looking at your stakeholders, you can go back and look at that map and you're updating it quarterly. So all of this really fits in with the structures that we've already put in place for reporting. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and you know, telling the story, uh, the story you know, we will talk about data being both qualitative and quantitative, but 
you know, also to keep in mind that you've got a variety of stakeholders from whom to gather feedback. The students are just one of the stakeholders. You've got faculty, you've got perhaps community partners, you've got employers, all of those constituents, uh, potential beneficiaries, have a viewpoint as to what your project is doing and how effective it is. So building in mechanisms by which to uh, speak with them regularly and get input from them regularly, I think is going to be an important piece of going forward. So actually working on developing a sustainability plan um, let's see, I wasn't planning to present this yet, but here we I, are. I can, with... I can jump forward if you like, and we can go back. Yes, let's go to the developer sustainability. There you go. Okay. Um, so key elements, uh, yeah, I'd say use data to make informed decisions, and hence uh, that um, chart that we have, and which you'll see again in a, in a minute. Uh, but it, you know, the decisions that you make about what activities to, to continue going forward should be based on some basic information. I mean, you should have data informed decision making. Uh, and in developing a sustainability plan, uh, or in any proposal even, I think it's important to establish milestones that you can measure along the way. It's not likely that, um, you know, if you go for some uh, funding, whether it's fundraising or grant writing, you're probably not going to obtain secure funding for the next 10 years in one, in one setting. And so you're not really going to be able to demonstrate in a short-term proposal uh, or fundraising request what your long-term outcomes are going to be. You can identify what you hope they are, but you can establish milestones along the way that are measurable and that lead you to be able to make inferences about those long-term goals. So those milestones, uh, you know, like I said, review your logic model to see what you said, but you know, what changes are you anticipating in knowledge, action, and conditions? And that's not just in the students, but in the faculty, in the institution, in the community, et cetera. And then what resources do you think will be needed to manage and operate future programming? I think when we talk about generating resources, I like to think of it as a um, total resource development plan and resources in a more comprehensive way than just securing money because there's, there are many ways that value can be added to your project and you could, you're going to be dependent on volunteers quite possibly. You could be getting donations of equipment. Um, there's a variety of things that uh, are very valuable. Shared f using facilities. These are all valuable uh, resources, but it's often a mistake to think well, we just need money. No, we don't just need money. We need these other things is what we really need. And so if you can get some of those things directly, that's a good thing. And, I, and a key piece of, of developing a sustainability plan is to have a written statement of what we're calling a value statement that can be used in marketing and fundraising. And uh, at the end of this, um, webinar, we are going to give you a worksheet that will be valuable in helping you to start crafting that value statement that we hope will lead to the input uh, for the fall symposium at College of the Canyons. So um, uh, we'll talk about that in, a, in a, another minute here or so. As I said earlier, uh, again, involve all the stakeholders and remain focused on your objectives because this is going to take some time. It's not easy to think out two, three, five years ahead. I've had some experience with that from doing grant writing and a lot of federal grants that have five-year project periods. Uh, and that is a huge challenge to really be able to articulate in writing what something could conceivably look like, how it will unfold over a long period of time. 
So hence the value of writing a sustainability plan, or you might call it a business plan or, um, you know, uh, any number of terms that it, that it could go by. So now we could go oh, to... Can, um, can I just ask a quick question here? Sure. Um, I, I'm wondering how many of the colleges really expected the, the things that, that they have been able to achieve. I, uh, I believe a lot of the colleges have really surprised themselves in what was possible. And then I also know everyone's experienced setbacks and delays in some areas that they may have thought were going to be easy and straightforward. How do you, how do you advise people to balance that, um, that kind of almost conflicting emotion between the excitement of what could be possible based on the great things that have happened unexpectedly so far, well, uh, and also the kind of the fear about things not going as, as planned? One of the key reasons for doing um, continuous evaluation of a project is precisely uh, that reason. There are always unanticipated outcomes. There are always factors that you weren't able to think about or predict or um, really know ahead of time. Um, and so they could be both positive and negative. But that's part of the point of collecting data on a regular basis and involving feedback from your constituents because you will learn some things that you didn't know for your initial proposal or your initial project plan. And then you get to decide, uh, do we move in a new direction? Do we, uh, you know, how do we tailor to accommodate uh, this new good thing that's happening that we didn't anticipate uh, and add that to the funding, uh, you know, to the budget somehow uh, and or delete things that aren't working. But, um, that's the value of doing ongoing evaluation and collecting feedback on a regular basis. Thanks. So I think it's important. You know, there's always unanticipated outcomes. And I know when I uh, would write grant proposals, I would always, I, I, I talked about that often in the proposals that in the evaluation section, that that is one of the things uh, we will build in mechanisms to be alert to that identifying those unanticipated um, outcomes or activities or circumstances that need to be considered when you're going to the next phase. Yeah. So acknowledge the unknown. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. That's great advice. Thank it's you. It's part of evaluation. But let's, we can go now to that data collection um, oh. sheet if you want. That, there you go. And I don't know if it's easy to read this. It's kind of, I think it's going to be posted um, as a separate document as well. But this is just giving you an overview of ways of various ways of collecting data and getting feedback. There are questionnaires and surveys, checklists, interviews, uh, document reviews, um, direct observation and taking notes, doing focus groups, and or writing case studies. So these are this sheet just gives you uh, some of the advantages and challenges the overall purpose of each of those methods and then some of the advantages and challenges to consider. When you put together your data collection plan, you can consider the variety of ways in which you already have access to data through your institution, but there are other ways in which you can collect data. I know at the Central Coast uh, Makerspace, we've done focus groups with the staffs of the three partner organizations. Um, we started and will continue to do focus groups with the participating faculty and the student interns and, um, uh, you know, and put that all together. Ultimately, I think we intend to uh, hopefully build on the experience report that we submitted to ISAM and actually write a case study on the project that we're doing, which we're hoping somewhat mirrors the statewide network. <laughs> I'm sure uh, in both challenges and opportunities and, uh, and whatnot. But this, this little uh, cheat sheet here will give you a little bit of work to go on. And of course, you, it's, you may have an institutional research office and they could help you as well with 
um, helping you figure out ways of collecting data or using data that already exists in the institution. But I'm, I'm keen on focus groups and actually talking to people and uh, really getting their insights and um, hearing from them directly. They'll have, and to consider getting input from uh, all the stakeholders. I was saying earlier, it's not just reporting on the students. Hopefully this project is uh, changing some of the ways your faculty think about teaching. Uh, that will be important to gather data and, and information from them, uh, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, of you know how, how are they incorporating use of the makerspace into their curriculum? How is it uh, helping them or not, uh, you know, create interdisciplinary learning projects with their students? There's so many ways that uh, faculty can be changed by virtue of this as well. And your employers and outside partners will have some insight to share. So I'd like to encourage, you know, collecting input from a variety of sources because you're going to hopefully be reliant on their, their, the strength of their perceptions of your project to make the case for sustaining the work that you want to do for institutionalizing your project. So to the next slide, where are we after? Mm -hmm. You can go to the next, not that one, but um, moving beyond startup. There we go. Moving beyond startup as we, um, I call it demonstrating impact. You know, it's when we talk about grant programs, um, I use the term outcome, and, and, and of course we did logic models and the, you're demonstrating short-term, medium-term, and long-term outcomes there as well. Uh, but when you think about an outcome, we want to think about What's going to be different by virtue of this project? What's going to be different in the students? What's going to be different in the faculty? What's the impact? You know, what's the so what of your program? There's any number of things we could be doing, but if we don't know why we're doing it or what the ultimate thing is that we want to be different, then it's going to be hard to um, uh, know whether or not you're really getting there. But as I said earlier, you're going to do a proposal. It might be for a one-year grant or it might be to a foundation for some funding. It's not likely to be um, an endowment that takes you through the rest of time. So how can you demonstrate that you're really on the path to those long-term outcomes? Well, one of the ways is to establish milestones that you can use to monitor progress toward those longer term outcomes. And those milestones provide an approximation of the status of your program implementation. And then you can set targets for each of the milestones as the standards for success. So when you're doing your reporting to, your, to the next funder, um, you, you have some basis upon which to say, hey, we're on target to meet our goals, to meet our longer term outcomes. And, and these are the milestones that we're achieving along the way. So I just wanted to give a brief example here for um, something like that, how you would do that. So in our makerspace programs, for example, an outcome might be that 50% of makerspace student interns get jobs in a field related to their discipline. Then a milestone might be the degree to which they begin applying for jobs and get interviews after their first internship. And a target might be that 75% of them do so. So even though that's a little bit of a simplistic example, it demonstrates how you can set measurable milestones leading to your desired outcomes. So in your, in your proposals, in your um, fundraising uh, papers and so on. Um, uh, this is important. This is important to think through and to know uh, how you can do. I think of those milestones in a way as I use a, an if-then analogy. If we do this, 
then this will happen. And then if we do the next thing, that will happen. So at each of those if-then points along the way, you could actually set measurable targets. And it doesn't matter if you attain those targets exactly, that isn't the point. The point is to be able to assess for yourself how close you are and how well you're doing toward that target, because then you make programmatic adjustments accordingly. Does that make any sense? I hope. Yeah, that, you know, that makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider how long it takes for these projects to unfold. I mean, we're talking about institutional change and yes. culture shift. And if you're only looking at that one distant outcome that's going to take five to seven years to get to, you, you won't know unless you're creating those milestones that are a lot closer to where you are now. Agreed, and it'll be hard to convince funders along the way that you're really doing something valuable. Mm. You know, and it's one thing for um, students to say, I, I like it. You know, I'm, I like it. This is good. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. But is that really going to be su sufficient in the long run uh, for making a solid case for the fact that this pro that you want this program to be institutionalized in your institution, you want it to be integrated into the fabric of the college or the community in our case, and that's a big deal. And uh, funders are going to really want to know something substantive, as well as hearing the experiences of the people using these projects. Mm. All right, so let's talk about making the case for sustainability. I'm going to, you know, as I said earlier, we'll have some homework for you uh, to write a case for support, a value statement, uh, which you could think of as a written call to action. And that case statement, and you'll have a worksheet to guide yourself through that process uh, for the fall symposium. But this will help you think about what it is you want to do and, and how, to, how to approach funders and or grant proposals. If you can think through and develop a case statement for yourself, a value statement. I'm going to start with what your vision is. And a vision is, you know, what do you want to be as opposed to the mission statement, which is what do you want to do? Now, with the Central Coast Makerspace, you saw us in that slide earlier. That was our strategic planning session with our partners. And this is precisely the work we were embarking on. And the, um, uh, so we have developed our vision and mission statements, which are presented here. The Central Coast Makerspace is a network of makerspaces supporting regional economic vitality and a continuum of learning. And our mission is to foster a diverse community of makers and innovators. Now, this description of our purpose, I don't think the group has um, agreed to yet, or I, I probably just made it up in some documents I've been preparing for our network. But we're a network of makerspaces to engage people of all ages in discovery activities while connecting them with a valuable community resource for informal learning. The starting place for your value statement is there. The vision, the mission, the purpose. And stating why it matters, what the benefit is to each of the beneficiaries, each of the constituents who have access to, to the makerspace. When we did our first um, strategic planning workshop, we had an employer present and he presented an interesting uh, question when we were starting to think about these questions, he said, well, what, do, what are you? Do you wanna be educational, recreational, or commercial? And I thought, well, that is a great way to frame this. And, you know, it's not necessarily an either or. And I think as uh, Deborah was saying earlier, you know, NACI wants to partner with the network. And there are tremendous entrepreneurial possibilities at the same time as there are educational possibilities and, and possibly commercial possibilities. There are things we can produce to market. When I was 
at ISAM, I met uh, someone from a community college in New Jersey who actually had some projects that they were doing in their maker space that they were selling right there on campus actually <laughs> to um, provide some resources for the supplies that they needed in their maker space. So, you know, they were building in little commercial enterprises right there in their maker space. And it's important also to, to be thinking about the fact that community colleges, as they're moving toward outcome-based funding, you know, there's possibilities uh, for uh, generating revenues to help sustain the college. That would be a great case that you can make to the college for institutionalization if, in fact, you can demonstrate income-producing activities and possibilities with your makerspace. Equally important in your mission and vision statements and, and statement of purpose would be to align with the um, Chancellor's Office uh, workforce development objectives, of course, as that's what we're all doing and what we're all doing this for has to do with uh, workforce development programs in the state and moving the economy forward, giving people the skills that they need for viable careers, et cetera. So one more slide before we go to the, um, the case statement. So this written case statement that we're going to ask you to work on to tell your story includes these various components, a bit of your project's history and major accomplishments, testimonials and anecdotal experiences of participants. Again, remember faculty and students and employers. What challenges they face and how the project addresses them. You know, and again, uh, this is going to be important. Why do you exist? What are the issues? What makes this, what's the need here? And what are going to be the, the, the many facets that you need to address in the next three to five years, uh, having to do with these various uh, resources, financial, technological, facilities, staffing, et cetera. And, um, you know, it's important in your case statement as well to know your funder, to tailor your statement for the particular funder, but they'll want to know how their resource that they give you is going to be used and how their involvement is going to be acknowledged. So it's important to really tailor your, your, your requests to them, whether it's a grant proposal or a, uh, uh, a foundation um, uh, request. So know who they are. It's got, you've got to know who they are and tailor your statement to them. Now, if we look at the, at the worksheet, this value statement, by the way, is just a, it can be like just one piece of your overall sustainability plan. You know, we're here at the Central Coast Makerspace. We're going to, we have one more strategic planning session um, uh, on the books before the consultant will actually present us with a draft strategic plan. So our statement here that we'll be working on, our case statement, our value statement, will just be one piece of that. But I thought this would be a good starting place for uh, thinking through these necessary issues and working toward that larger project should you uh, be able to move forward in that direction. I don't know how easy it is to see this, um, to read this on the screen, but this too is also available for a download. Uh, but the value statement, I'll just read that introductory piece and then go through the primary topics here to hopefully you'll use this as a template and uh, come up with uh, two or three paragraphs for each of these prompts uh, and bring it with you to the fall symposium so that we can all be talking about sustainability. So the value statement is a starting point for conversations with potential donors and is used as the basis for making your case and grant proposals. Ultimately, your statement should be customized for different donors and purposes. And then it asks you to write two or three paragraphs in each of the prompts below. 
Uh, start with your makerspace's name, a brief history, and a statement of vision and mission. Well, I shared ours, and uh, so that's a, a good starting place there. And then what is your purpose? You know, what is the need your project fulfills, and why is it important to be addressed? And why are you uniquely positioned uh, to address this need? Another important prompt is to know who, who are all of the constituents, the target populations served by the project. What are their demographic, what are the demographic, demographics, characteristics, circumstances, and challenges of the populations that benefit from your activities? Again, there are multiple populations, most likely. What are the activities and services you provide? How does your makerspace address the circumstances and challenges your target populations face? And what is your track record? Again, going back to what are your accomplishments and what have you, uh, how do you know that you're on track to really uh, move forward and institutionalize this? What are your goals for the future? And what are the programmatic and technology and staffing needs? What resources do you have and what additional resources will you need? Again, being able to identify the key budget items and um, what needs can be met with volunteers or donated use of facilities and equipment, as we said earlier. And what specific items would help your project move ahead? And again, this would be tailored over time, but those things need to be identified if you're making a request for funding. And most significantly at the end, to be able to be able to state, why does your makerspace deserve support? What will be done with the donor's money support? How will your constituents be better served? And what will be different because of the project? So I think this is a, a relatively simple, but not so simple <laughs> worksheet to be thinking through. And as you could see, this is very key to whether it's a grant proposal, whether it's a request for funding from a foundation or a donor, uh, and or in individual donations from people in, in your community. But this, I think, is a good starting place for working on uh, thinking about sustainability, writing a value statement, and trying to get your project set up for um, you know, three to five years from now. So that's all I have for today, but it uh, would be nice to have some questions or some conversation, perhaps. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone now so that if you have a question, please just, because a lot of people are calling in, you're not necessarily on. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to unmute people. So if you have a question, please just jump in. Uh, if you don't have a question, then perhaps just uh, make sure you're keeping it, keep it down over there. Okay. All right. Uh, and I see that Bree has just joined us. I'm thank you so much for joining us, Bree. I uh, sorry we didn't get to introduce you a little earlier, but um, yeah, I'm sorry for getting here so late. I thought oh, I had no, no, no. It's it's a it's okay. no no problem. Okay. But uh, um, this this is Maura. I have a Maura from City College. I have a question. If I can jump in first. Yeah, please do. Sure. Okay. So, um, so thank you very much for this. This was um, great and um, very timely because um, along with, um, you know, our very supportive um, administrators around workforce at City College, we've also been um, working on our value statement and um, thinking about sustainability. And um, just uh, maybe this is kind of a question comment. Um, so one of the one of the things that we're seeing with the the spaces that we've been setting up is that um, you know particularly in our library space where we've gotten some new furniture that's related to collaboration and giving a space for students to work um, is that it's resulting in students being on campus 
longer, like like coming to campus for a reason and stay having a reason to stay and be on campus. And um, and you know, for a college that typically has been, you know, you know, for lack of a better term, a commuter college where you know people come and take their classes and then leave and go to work and all those other things. I was just wondering if you have any comments or um, or thoughts thoughts on that as how um, you know how to max you know how to um, describe the maximum benefit the value of a space that gives students a destination or um, a reason to come and stay on campus longer. Well, it, it's an interesting uh, observation and certainly something worth noting in your in your value statement because I think that um, there's research that indicates that students who go to uh, four-year universities, particularly as residents, do develop that sense of uh, being one of them, you know, that that's, they identify with the institution and because they're there and they're with a cohort of people who are there on a regular basis. And that's something that's been a problem with community colleges, with the commuter colleges that students come and go and um, don't have an opportunity for that kind of um, gelling with their peers necessarily. It's, hmm. it's certainly one of the reasons that we have uh, specially funded programs like the TRIO programs and, and some others at Hancock. We have the STEM Center. And this, precisely the same thing happens when students uh, with whom they have uh, similar needs and issues uh, can develop these peer relationships. They help each other. They help each other develop a sense of identity, not only with the college, but with, with the idea that they're learning together and they're sharing a goal. Uh, many of the students at Hancock are first generation students and so they're really getting that support from each other in these specially funded programs. And um, I think it goes to what you're talking about. Uh, so maybe looking at some of the, the literature that's out there on the benefits of, of these programs that develop specialized centers uh, for students, um, you know, I think, I think that might be helpful for you in your case statement. Thank you, that's really helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just, as a follow-up question, Suzanne, I mean, we're, we're also talking about this aligning with ideas about the services that libraries provide, and you just mentioned these other student support centres. Is part of this um, maybe recharacterizing the makerspace in ways that can utilise research, existing research or institutional data um, so saying that uh, rather than thinking about the makerspace in a particular way as just a room full of tools, but if you were to align it with the purpose of the library, which is open access to resources or some other kind of argument, that can really help strengthen your position. I agree. I think there's a couple of angles that can be pursued. There's research out there um, that uh, indicates that uh, students that we might call non-traditional students uh, benefit more from learning that is something other than, you know, the guru standing up in front of the class and just telling you everything about the discipline. Uh, they learn by doing and learn better by doing and therefore they become engaged learners. And I think the makerspace is certainly ideal for that. So. Uh, but actually demonstrating that learning is happening is, I think, one of the challenges. But there's a huge body of research out there on informal learning and informal learning in uh, school settings and not school settings. And so that's, that's an important piece. But I think there's also important to actually think about um, integrating with the existing curriculum in ways, and, and Brie, you can probably say more about this than I can, um, since you're, I think Folsom's done a great job with that and, and their work. Um, but 
anyway, just to say that part of the challenge I think we face is actually demonstrating that learning is happening in these informal environments. Yes, there are these social possibilities for social cohesion and, and collaborative activities and uh, democratizing of, of learning in some ways. And so, uh, I don't know, Bree, do you have some thoughts on that? Um, I was just gonna say, I think you, you hit one of the biggest issues, which is demonstrating that learning. It's really hard. It's hard to capture the learning and it's hard to show it in a quantitative way, which is often what is desired. <clears throat> but I think, um, what you guys are talking about too, about shared resources like Deborah was, I only caught a little bit of what you said, Deborah, but it sounded like you were talking about um, just thinking of it as a resource for the whole campus, not, not necessarily only as a space where people make, but a space where people gather. Those kinds of social benefits go beyond some of the demonstrated learning and happen I foster a kind of culture that's important for things way down the line. So that's just something that's really hard to demonstrate though. Suzanne, you mentioned that there is uh, research about incorporating learning, but I think there is also research about the importance of spaces like that. So I think mm -hmm. maybe I can look into trying to collect some of that and then send it to you guys to put on. Sure, and I, can, I can share some of that too, because I've written many trio grants and, and, you know, the liter there's literature on just the value of those kind of uh, spaces and environments. But yeah. yeah, I've got some things I can send too. And following the library model is a, is a smart way to just be efficient with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, the Maker Ed convening is coming up next, uh, where is it? October 19th and 20th, I think, around about then, um, up in San Jose. And the K, they're primarily K-12, though we're starting to align with them um, quite effectively. The K-12 uh, research is maybe relevant also in this area because their assessment of learning is um, much more, um, how should we say, uh, <laughs> insistent and relentless <laughs> uh, than ours. But I think that that's one area where we can really um, start to look at research because we're, we're also encouraging colleges to align to the K-12s because there's $150 million in strong workforce funds that's coming down directly to the K-12 space. So any demonstrated learning outcomes that you can connect back into the K-12 um, uh, you know, their framework is going to be incredibly valuable uh, in terms of not just um, having access and guiding your K-12 partners through, um, it'll, it'll not only give you an opportunity to use funding to strengthen your K-12 pipeline, but it's going to benefit your outcomes in the long term, which will help with outcomes-based funding. So this is, you know, when we start talking about this really long view, these are kinds of some of the ways you can start thinking strategically. And I, I don't want to just real quick. Um, oh, about a year ago, I wrote uh, CCST put out a, um, a K through 12 like literature review for maker spaces. And there, there are some, um, there's a collection there of some of the literature about assessing learning um, and some of the frameworks that are using K through 12 that might be really applicable to other spaces as well and um, just ways to survey people that might be useful. Um, I can send it to Deborah and maybe you can put that out too. Yeah, that would be helpful. That's helpful. Sounds, yeah. sounds, like, we should, done. sounds like we should have a whole webinar just on that. Uh, um, and we'll do it around the time of the Maker Ed convening uh, because the K-12 space is, is really, you know, it's it's really important that we move. Oh, and also the the Cal states are moving in. I was just going to bring that. Up. <laughs> I was just going to bring that up. I mean, we're in an ideal position to really promote that pipeline of learning. You know, with between the K-12s and CSUs as the CSUs embark on this. And if there's a way we can use, well, you know, whatever the two plus two plus two model from way back when. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and. Um, target that with our institutions that the maker spaces have a great opportunity, you know, to be uh, that middle section. We know a lot of 
a lot of students do go to community college before they transfer to the CSUs. And so, you know, um, uh, integrating maker activities into the curriculum, uh, I think, is, is ideal. But that's a challenge for faculty at the colleges is how to do that and um, engaging them and wanting to do that. Doing interdisciplinary work is one thing, but even engaging any kind of making activities into their existing curriculum, I mean, is probably completely possible. And, um, you know, and, and uh, at Hancock, I think uh, Rob, Rob's team uh, did an interesting project with Spanish speaking uh, folks in the community ed program in the ESL class that was yet another population that completely benefited and got totally engaged in activities. Um, and, you know, can you make the case that that helps them then transfer into, into credit bearing courses? That's part of the objective there. So that was an interesting project, which I hope continues. Mm. And uh, actually, you just touched on something. We're going to be talking to Daniel Donnelly from Butte College in a few weeks about how they're using their curriculum design process to develop that pipeway working mm -hmm. pipeline, working with um, students who are transitioning in and affiliating with a college success course. So these are some of the really right. creative ways we can think about how we expand through that pathway. Right. We have uh, a question online from Mary Govars. She said, I wanted to ask about the fundraising. fundraising. Sorry, I have a little feedback on the line. I wanted to ask about the fundraising me. that Suzanne talked about. Was it club related uh, or through the makerspace or both? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh. go ahead. So um, what you had mentioned about fundraising, and I know some of the challenges that we face here at Cabrillo is when we do fundraising, um, it's, it, you have to be really careful about, you know, how you get the money. And I know with, when we did with the clubs, you can't ask for money, you can get donations. So what I'm wondering is with the makerspace, and this is what I'm trying to figure out because if we, we basically have two spaces here, um, is can we do fundraising for the makerspace and that can go towards the makerspace or does it have to be through a certain pipeline? I'm just, how do we do that? I'm just. Well, um, uh, first thing I would say is you probably have a, a foundation. We do. Does fundraising. Right. And so I would assume you'd have to engage them. Okay. In some way to work with you on this. Um, I think part of developing a sustainability plan or a business plan uh, would be to address just that. How are you going to raise money? Well, we've, we've definitely, we have had some help from our foundation. I just, I was just, that piqued my interest when you mentioned about fundraising because it yeah. does become kind of tricky. Um, sure. and for it is, I think it is going to be, I think it is going to be a little tricky uh, in a sense, but um, uh, you know, so will grant writing be, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's always so unpredictable. And I know in our case of the Central Coast Makerspace um, Partnership, we are envisioning that, you know, sometimes possibly the college would be the fiscal agent. Sometimes the grant might go to the museum or the library. Uh, fundraising will happen separately from each of those organizations, as well as we'll do some fundraising jointly, most likely, um, you know, for greater community impact. But the, yeah, many challenges that have to be addressed in that. So typically with foundation funding, you need to use a 501c3, typically, in order to receive those funds. Mm -hmm. hence, hence the working with your foundation Sure. I just was curious in that specific. Yeah. So and ways we could generate income for the space. I mean, but. I think that's another topic, you know, is <laughs> I mentioned, are, are you going to have some commercial activities? You know, mm -hmm. because if you have some commercial activities as that college in New Jersey that I mentioned, they do, they make some products and right. sell them in the college. Yeah. And uh, so I'm not sure, you know, how they work with their business office to actually, um, you know, put the money in, in an account for them or not. That's yeah. an internal 
uh, sure. procedural thing. But, you know, I think those are the things that need to be thought through, which is why I think it's important to start thinking about this and how to do that kind of sustainability plan and generating resources from a variety of angles, from a variety of sources. Grant writing is probably going to be one, but that's such a long shot usually, you know, particularly uh, with unpredictable state and federal budgets. And, uh, you know, you have your foundations, uh, you have corporations that give donations and or uh, grants. So those different kind of proposals to be writing there than federal or state proposals. But the things we talked about in this value statement, I think will all pertain no matter where you're going for funding. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing if I could on the, on the potential for uh, raising funds. Mm -hmm. That uh, in addition to the foundation or clubs, on our campus, we have an auxiliary accounting area of the business office, and that's that's where programs like welding program that have like industrial sponsors or what have you, they can contribute to that program specifically through the auxiliary account. People might want to investigate if their colleges has one or not, and we were able to set up a makerspace auxiliary account and and deposit uh, deposit uh, contributions into that and pay for uh, expenses out of that. It's all, it's all got to be like legit, you know, it's got to be makerspace in, makerspace out, but, uh, but, it, but it's a much easier vehicle uh, and you've got, you've got control over the account where it's, you know, not, maybe not necessarily the case if, if you're running it through the foundation, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and didn't you have uh, the experience also of doing a um, workshop for industry where they're paying for it? And that's I did. Uh, I, you know, I, I attempted at first to do it through a legit uh, fee-based course, but the administration uh, didn't want to sign off on it. And so we just marketed it ourselves as a, a, as a workshop and, it, uh, and we charged a fee of $100 a person. And we, you know, Belinda's on the call. We basically sold it out in a day or two, you know. And the employers are paying. Yeah, they're the, paying the hundred bucks for for their employees to attend this workshop. Right. I mean, it's kind of contract ed, really. It's what yeah, it is. Yeah, contract ed. Yeah. But uh, but uh, it's it's through the office. How is that? How is the content related to makerspace activities? What is it you're doing? It's it's uh it's basically programming uh, industrial computers. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do another one with uh. Uh, you know, they're using Arduinos and, and Raspberry Pis a lot in, in uh, coding in, as, in industry. And so we're going to be doing a follow-up uh, workshop on, on, on those types of computers. And, you know, it's something that college should do in its electronics program, but they don't. So, uh, and it's something industry demands because they're, they're running off of computer stuff, you know? Right. And it's just, we we're able to fill this particular need, you know? So, so there's some example. <laughs> and there's a, that's a really good example that should be working its way into your, um, your value um, mm -hmm. statement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and don't forget also that if you, tie, if you tie the makerspace to specific programs, you can charge materials fees. I'm not sure if that's sort of where you were going with your question, Mary. I think it was also an idea about um, student, student business and um, student fundraising. Uh, and that's something else that we'll be looking at um, more later on too, uh, under the entrepreneurship banner. But right. um, Thank you. I do think we are out of time at this point. In fact, we've gone a few minutes over, but it's been fun. So uh, if there are any, if there's any final statement, Suzanne, that you, you wanted to make? No, I just want to encourage people to actually, you know, tackle this challenge of making a written statement, you know, a value statement. And, um, you know, so we can have a robust discussion in, November and really start working on sustainability plans. Um, uh, I know that I'm going to be doing that with our partnership here 
in Santa Maria uh, working on a sustainability plan, an actual document in alignment with our strategic plan and, uh, you know, helping them with fundraising strategies and um, identifying potential funding resources and so on. So, you know, that's what we have to do next. Mm-hmm. So, yep. That's it. Everybody's got to get going on it if we want to continue to exist. (laughs) That's so true. Can't wait till May. (laughs) Well, thanks very much, Suzanne. Thank Um, you. You know, for kicking this off, this is going to be a subject that we're going to be talking about a lot. Uh, And we're going to build towards the November the 30th event in um, Symposium in uh, College of the Canyons. And so we're here to help you move through these steps um, and uh, to share the knowledge across the network and have everyone develop a really robust plan moving forward. So I want to thank everyone for attending today. We will uh, we'll post this recording on both the CCC Maker website and I'll also post a link to Workplace. So if you want to review any of this, um, feel free, go back and look at it again. And I'll also post these couple of documents um, that you can use. uh, uh, Also, I'll post those on Workplace. So there'll be a lot more to come on this. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we'll be doing this in our Thursday 12 to 1 slot from now on, um, Um, irregularly. But um, most weeks we'll have a discussion. As you can see, it's going to be your work presented. It's not going to be just tap stuff. Uh, So this is far more about sharing information across the network um, from what you're learning and how you're uh, how you're doing at the moment. So thank you very much, everyone. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all soon. And uh, see you later. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.